Okay, so good morning. Um, thanks for your patience uh, while things getting set up. Um, great to uh, see everyone again and to be together for a uh, final day of our <coughs> coverage of the combination of data science and system science um, and when applied to health. Mm. In terms of retrospective, yesterday was a day where we built on and extended several foundational ideas that we had explored in the first three days and uh, applied them to the challenge of analysis. So yesterday morning, we saw a technique that directly combined two previous techniques each powerful that we had encountered. On the one hand, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques for sampling parameter values for dynamic models such that the distribution induced reflected how the model matches up against empirical data. In short, we, we use the empirical data to estimate in the form of sampling from it a distribution over those parameter values. And it's not just the distribution over each independently, it's a joint distribution over them. That was MCMC. But with PMCMC, we combine that with this uh, approach of particle filtering that has uh, formed uh, perhaps the central position in this uh, boot camp as a technique to to uh, bring together dynamic models which uh, embody theory for the underlying situation with empirical evidence regarding that underlying situation and seek to ground those models and reground them on an ongoing basis in the observations, using those observations to help us estimate the underlying state of the system that we're modeling. So there, we're not using this external data to predominantly estimate parameter values, so there, there can be some of that. Rather, we're using it to, to get an understanding of what's going on in the system right now in terms of the underlying situation. Particle filtering was a technique that we explored, especially on days two and three, and um, served as an important element of, um, of, of the broader data science uh, edifice that, that we've been applying to dynamic models. Yesterday we saw how those two techniques could be combined to provide a very powerful, also very computationally expensive method that would simultaneously estimate the parameters and the underlying state of the model, but not again in isolation. Rather, give us a joint distribution over those parameters and the underlying state of the model. It did so with a very important feature that I had purposefully left till yesterday rather than teaching it, but previously uh, highlighting it. And that is the fact that particle filtering, and by extension MCMC, excuse me, by extension PMCMC, particle MCMC, can not only allow us to probe what's going on right now using data available from earlier, but and, in, and the analogy I made was to, to hidden Markov models, can allow us to knit together data from later points in time, retrospectively, to reconstruct what was going on earlier. And the way in which we did that with particle filtering is we sample from trajectories. We can sample from trajectories of change over time, or each such trajectory involves posited state at previous points in time and so the full state of the model. And so what we get out is not merely a depiction of the distribution of underlying state at a particular time in light of previous evidence, but rather we can sample stories of what happened over time where each such story posits at a particular time, it, this precise thing was the case. At this next point in time, this precise thing was the case. At this next point in time, this precise thing was the case. It's kind of a, 
a, a, a history or biography, as it were, of the system being described that's posited, that's hypothesized by that particle. And we, to do that, we sampled the particles at the final time according to their weight, and we made use of this, these constructs that I call ancestry matrices, and indeed that's the term used in, in the paper, the Andrea paper, uh, where they're featured for particle, filter, or particle MCMC. And we use it to reconstruct this history over time. And that's particularly powerful, um, not least because it, it gives us this better ability to probe what was going on in earlier times than we could ever achieve through just the data available till that point. It, it, it allows us to look at those earlier times in light of what subsequently happened and use that to hone our understanding of what was the case at that earlier time. But beyond that, this ability to sort of sample trajectories or histories, which we have in the hidden Markov models in the context of the Viterbi algorithm, um, gives us kind of a compelling understanding of the dynamics of the system over time as posited by one particle or another. And there might be a lot of shared features between them. So particle MCMC, bringing together particle filtering and, and MCMC methods, uh, was, was a technique that allowed us to jointly sample them. Any one sample from it would include value of, of all the parameters that we're sampling the static parameters in contrast to the dynamic parameters that are limited to sampling and particle filtering, and then the state of the underlying model, which might include any dynamic parameters as well. So we're sampling from that. We're saying for, for these, uh, with, this, uh, with this set of static parameters, this is a trajectory we might expect, et cetera. And we go on and on with those might sample hundreds of thousands of them. And we do that in a sort of alternating process where we sample from the parameters, the theta, conditional on the last trajectory we sampled, conditional on that being the latent state. And then we go into sampling from the latent state conditional on the, on the, the candidate uh, parameter value. And, and provide this alternation back and forth between them that allows us to sample from both. I promised you code that implements this and one of my goals today is to make sure I post that as well as some other other sets of code that um, that, that need to, are needed to complete the set. The growing the code that's present is uh, significant and growing right now on the site I've provided to you and it's one of my bequests as part of this uh, part of this boot camp to make sure that if you are interested in going deeper, you're equipped uh, to do so uh, by reference to those code bases, which of course we'd be dis pleased to discuss with you. For example, I have posted some code from Refon um, in earlier days uh, for harvesting, um, harvesting uh, or linking together data that's harvested from uh, Google search queries. I posted code from Yang Chen um, which uh, focuses on hidden Markov models that she presented yesterday in R uh, that implements um, and estimates a model. And uh, there may be some other elements of code I've posted there that aren't on the top of my mind. Uh, we'll be posting a lot more before the end of this event or before, the, um, before that's all finished, probably by tonight. Okay, so that was one element we saw yesterday. Um, we then went on, we took a, a somewhat different turn, but one that was of a whole with what we had already uh, seen. We drew on ideas on which we, had, which we had laid out and on which we had previously built in other ways. And that is this notion, and, and that particularly harnessing this notion that in complex systems, and these dynamic systems which cause us such trouble in the world, they, they really are the things that we struggle with and, and that, that require so much effort and, and, um, and um, trial and error often to try to 
control effectively, try to manage, try to, try to grapple with. When we're dealing with those systems, those systems are, are um, distinguished, perhaps most notably, and certainly as a prominent feature, by the fact that they're tangled. Meaning, what goes on in one part of the system reflects what's going on in different parts of the system. So UN's work I mentioned for the Ministry of Health in terms of dynamic modeling related to ED weights clearly showed that when it comes to attributing, attributing um, issues uh, for, for having um, contributed to high ED weights or in trying to solve the problem of ED weights in a more proactive way, you need to look well beyond the emergency department. You need to, to look at what's going on in the wards and by extension the wards, the ALC patients who can't be moved out of the hospital and from there to the community and to what's going on in the community in terms of service availability and capacity to discharge patients to the community in a timely fashion because of service availability or because of availability of, uh, of, of, of homes near their informal care networks or what have you. So um, this tangling that you see in the ED um, context is just one element of tangling. I'd mentioned the opioid you know, crisis as another component where you know, what goes on in doctor's offices in terms of prescription policy ends up affecting policing in terms of dispatch calls. It ends up affecting what's going on in corrections. It ends up affecting what social services has to deal with in terms of families that have been ripped apart by the burden of addiction and substance abuse. So we're dealing with these tangled systems, ladies and gentlemen, and these tangled systems present us challenges to manage them. But what we took advantage of yesterday was that tangling for insight. I had argued that previously that we can get great insights into these systems by viewing different data sets not as solitudes, not as fragmented stovepiped sort of sets of data that are each is uh, in uh, examined in isolation but rather as different facets, different faces of an underlying system, a common underlying dynamic system, which has many faces to it, just as Janus in, in, in the ancient world um, was said to have many faces. And within that context, we view these time series, each, each is sort of speaking to us about different areas of the system. And by combining them with a dynamic model that captures dynamics across that system, we can illumine using, using the tools of dynamic modeling together with these, uh, these, these time series, what's going on throughout the model. I analogized it to a three-dimensional image as produced by an MRI or a uh, CAT scan, but, but even more so, it's, inf it's more like four-dimensional because it gives us something more like a functional MRI where you actually see over time what's going on throughout the system. And that's what particle MCMC, that's what particle filtering can give us by knitting together these different points of evidence from different areas of the system um, with a model, they can they can help us posit what's likely happening throughout the model. And we'll be seeing an opioid example using that for PMCMC, but that was very much what was pointed to by work by Shao Yan and, and work by uh, Rifat and, and uh, the, the work on particle filtering that underlay Lugia's demonstration with uh, ED um, wait times and with that data coming in every 15 minutes. It was also the basis of what Anahita presented. This ability to get kind of a three-dimensional view over time of the underlying system from individual pieces of evidence, individual data sets that are on their own are unremarkable. But because they're different facets of an underlying system, 
who, which we depict, whose unity we depict with a model, we can, we can get an understanding of what's going on in different systems. That's so much of the promise of data science when combined with system science right there. But what I showed yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, was at the same time more provocative and more hopeful. And that was harking back to work from the 1980s and the mathematician Flores Takens. I noted that each of the data sets over time taken from a complex system, a system with these tangled parts, will tell you more than just about the part of the system whence it's taken, the, the part of the system from which it happens to be taken. Rather, it whispers to us about what's going on in areas of the system that drive it, that affect it, that are, that are contributing to it. And I used an example that's, that's based on a, a classic um, a dynamical system uh, model, um, which was for, for predator prey, for lynx and hares. It's a model with Canadian roots based on observations from the Hudson Bay Company on snowshoe hares and lynx populations in the Canadian North, which noted these oscillations. And um, mathematicians sought to investigate these oscillations. Why, in some years, were, were rabbit pelts very, very plentiful in arriving and why some years were they uh, very, uh, were they far, far more restricted in numbers. Rather than blaming the trappers, they discovered that, that these underlying populations actually cycle, and they cycle in ways that reflected a fairly simple mathematical structure that's easily reproduced. But my point there in citing that example was that knowing what for example, the lynx population is doing now. The fact that it's rising rapidly and it's already high tells you a lot about what's going on with the hares because it points to the fact there's got to be a lot of hares around or else the lynx will not be multiplying like crazy. Um, there's got to be a lot of hares around for them to eat. And by the flip side, if hares are dropping quickly in number, it's, a, uh, it's an indication that probably the lynx are numerous and, and are eating the hares um, in large numbers such that the hares numbers are, are being driven down. In short, knowing about data from one area of the system, say the data that Hudson Bay Company was collecting on snowshoe hares, that that data tells us quite a bit about this other part of the system, the links. And so it is with these complex systems. Knowing, having data about one part of the system actually whispers to us about what's going on the other part of the system if we only know how to listen. If we only know how to listen. And yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, I taught you a way to listen. To listen. Um, I provided a method grounded in mathematical proof and theory from Flores Takens by which you could use one of those ob sets of observations over time to reconstruct the state and indeed the state space, a set of possible states of the system and view how it's changing over time. Any one of those pieces of data systematically reconstruct in this way with something called delay embedding um, where you're creating these vectors out of, out of elements evenly spaced of the original time series can allow us to, to reconstruct an underlying trajectory space where the system state is evolving. Any one of those time series can, can do that in a way that illumines the, the behavior of the system, the logic by which it works. But I have to be careful here because I'm going to link this to CCM in a moment. 
And it's not just that it eliminates the whole system. It eliminates all things that are driving in. And that is the rub. That's the key thing for CCF. There's things that it doesn't eliminate that are the things perhaps downstream of it, which don't drive it, but um, it drives. And this ability to reconstruct the state space of a system has many manifest uses. From, from insights as to its drivers, to aspects of the, of the uh, understanding of the dimensionality of the system, the sort of the, the underlying degrees of freedom of the system to, to prediction. But we focused yesterday on one particular aspect. We focused, ladies and gentlemen, for the subsequent lectures on, on using it to gain insight into what variables are driving which other variables causally. Sorting through all the all the, the cruft of, of caused by noise, all the all the distractions caused by noise and, and correlation caused by other variables. We could pick out whether variable A is causally driving variable B, whether variable B is instead driving A but not vice versa, whether both are driving each other or neither are driving each other. And it's very different from recognizing if they're correlations. And I noted, and I'd be glad to provide references if you were interested, that you can have correlation without causation. In fact, it's an old adage, right? Correlation does not imply causation. We can't take associations as shown to us, say, through a logistic regression model and immediately see the causal, the, 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 the causal structure of the system. We can have association without causation. And it turns out we can have causation without association as well, without correlation in complex systems. It is, it is possible because of the complex nature of the causation involved. You can have no obvious correlation between two things, but it's an important driver in it. So we saw how this technique of CCM, by allowing us to reconstruct, to ask a variable Y is, in fact, is driving variable X. We reconstructed the state space of variable X from variable X. We reconstructed its so-called shadow manifold. And that shadow manifold whispered to us, it spoke to us, it, it, it depicted the subparts of the system that are driving X. And by testing that in a systematic procedure that itself involved looking at prediction of values of Y and seeing how they stacked up against actual values of Y, we could actually see is is, is why incorporated in that reconstructed shadow manifold. And by extension, is it causally driving X? And that's a very different question than if X is causing Y. If we want to know if is X driving Y, we go and we reconstruct the shadow manifold of Y and see if X is incorporated in it. And so this is a method that allows us to to distinguish X causing Y, Y causing X, or indeed if both are causing each other or neither are causing each other. And I showed some examples of output from CCM algorithms as conducted in the REDM package uh, supported in R, which showed sort of faces of causation and faces of non-causal influence and I noted that it was a somewhat nuanced picture because of the presence of noise, the dependence on E and tau, E being the size of the embedding space, the, the number of elements in those vectors created, tau being the delay associated with the embedding, how far apart the items are that we're reconstructing the, the vectors from in the, in the original time series. And it also depended some on series length. This is a method of great promise. It's been applied to a number of real world systems. We've applied it to 
dozens and dozens of examples now. And have gotten a quite good understanding of its strengths and of its limitations, which are there. It is, it enjoys an appetite, some might argue inordinate appetite for data. The time series should be at least, in my view, hundreds, if not thousands in length. Although its creator, George Sugihara of Scripps Institute, does, does note a number of very impressive successful applications in time series um, you know, size in the 60s, I believe, for, for ocean measurements. It's a very impressive technique. It's a computationally expensive technique that uh, my student Bo Po and uh, with contributions also from Nutia have been, have been contributing to, to speed up greatly. Um, and we believe that one of its biggest promises lies with truly large scale, high velocity sources of data, such as we get from smartphones, from Twitter, and from tools such as look at search volumes over time, uh, such as Anahita used to such great effect in the context of particle filtering. And then, Earlier on, and then in the waning moments of yesterday, some of you entered the ocular domain in which you could, in three dimensions, explore structures, including those reconstructed through state space embedding, and, and get a feel for them. And it's my, it's my belief that visualization techniques when it comes to big data are not merely eye candy, they are valuable for insight. And for something like convergent cross mapping, they can be very valuable indeed for helping us understand some features of the underlying system and uh, arguably for understanding some of the results out of our CCM algorithm. Um, so the, the system you saw yesterday in the Oculus for exploring large amounts of data is in my mind uh, a very very important system going forward for, for going through large volumes of data and spotting unexpected patterns, but also for reasoning about the insights provided by, by analytic lenses, such as, um, such as those from um, delay embedding. Some of you um, seem to have enjoyed the experience. It, uh, it is a powerful one to see, see the state space reconstructed so viscerally in front of um, one's eyes. But I go on altogether too long. Um, uh, that was a bit of the retrospective on yesterday. Once again, we saw the foremost focus on insights arising from data coming from underlying tangled systems in a way that speaks to the contributions on the one hand of system science, focusing on these systems where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, where we have this tangling, sometimes to our woe, and data science, where we're dealing with these large volumes of typically high velocity data emerging from it. This morning, we are very fortunate to have a distinguished student in my lab, Yuan Tian, who sits before me, um, with us. Um, uh, Yuan uh, pursued a master's degree with our group um, to uh, great uh, note and, and success um, uh, a number of years ago, um, uh, after which she uh, spent uh, time in uh, Singapore working with uh, David Mashar's group there um, in health policy modeling. But we were most fortunate, and I can't, I almost can't express that strongly enough, to, to be able to bring her back um, to our fair province 
um, as the the lead and indeed the modeler the the, the modeler the architect of uh, our work with uh, uh, Ministry of Health um, modeling uh, ED weights and subsequently um, uh, connected care related modeling uh, UN um, uh, works as an analyst over at Health Quality Council and is a key person within the analytic ecosystem uh, of Saskatchewan being really the, um, the, the central figure when it comes to a number of modeling projects conducted with health practitioners and decision makers across the province. Her work has um, uh, been cited by many practitioners as groundbreaking, um, has shaped ministerial policy in big ways, and uh, I've uh, I've had prominent colleagues uh, who who uh, comment uh, emphatically on her her genius. So you asked. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to embarrass you too much, but, but it's, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta say, say truth when it when it comes out. Um, so, um, UN is very modest, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much putting her on the spot. But it, but it's, uh, I, I speak nothing but truth here. Um, now, uh, this morning, UN is actually with us, uh, not to speak on. Her modeling work, which uh, has led to many impressive presentations at past uh, boot camps focused on, on uh, system science methods, in particular agent-based modeling in the health area, um, uh, occasions where, where we look forward to future, um, uh, future featuring of her um, uh, in next summer's uh, boot camps, etc. But today she's with us to actually talk about a different project. One who lies just underneath this recording screen uh, on uh, Twitter data for influenza detection and surveillance, um, a technique that she used to, um, uh, with, with one of these big data sources of which I spoke. So I'm going to turn the floor over here to UN and, um, and uh, so that we can all uh, learn from her exploration in, in this uh, interesting and important area.